The 1960s were a definitive period in the music industry. For the first time in history, a British band had broke the charts. Beatlemania was rising, and so were people's interest in British music. Prior to this point in time, the UK charts were awash with American singers and film scores. But the Beatles hit the number one spot 17 times. No band or artist since has been able to do this. Three records, uh, Please Please Me, She Loves You and I Wanna Hold Your Hand are all number one. This list shows all the number ones the Beatles had, and all in less than a decade. But we're not just here to talk about the Beatles. We're here to talk about the staples of the British music industry. The bands that have kept music in Britain alive. Invasion Network presents The last UK rock bands to break the charts Our story begins in 1920s Jacksonville, Florida Blind Blake was one of the very first artists to introduce guitar to the ragtime music scene Before this point, ragtime music was usually played on piano Scott Joplin, the entertainer, released in 1902 well, Scott Joplin is widely known as the inventor of ragtime music. You can hear how it inspired Blind Blake's finger-picking style in his song Seaboard Stomp. This new guitar-based version of ragtime music went on to inspire countless musicians, eventually crisscrossing its way over to the British Isles. George Formby This cheeky chappy, believe it or not, was banned from the BBC. His lyrics were considered too naughty to be played on national radio. The musical establishment hated it and effectively banned his first single in 1933, entitled My Ukulele. There was a real censorship of working class expression. Real music by real artists were being stamped out left, right and centre, eventually being overshadowed by the dancehall craze up until the 1940s. The BBC were cancelling anything that wasn't squeaky clean. The Brits had no other option but to smuggle in records from other countries. Pirate radio ships were springing up everywhere. They would anchor themselves just off the coast of England, so it was legal. It was the people versus the establishment, and the establishment was a sinking ship. The people of Britain were finally hearing something new, the fresh rock and roll sounds of America. This sound went on to inspire Lonnie Donegan and Tommy Steele of the Steelman, but made popular by Cliff Richard and the Shadows. In 1959, Cliff and the Shadows managed to reach number one with the song Living Doll. Even though American rock and roll music was popular over here in Britain, this was the first time a UK band was successful with this sound and made it into the charts. Although reaching the number one spot 12 times in just four years, Britain needed to find its own unique sound. We needed something made in Britain. Liverpool in the early 1960s would be the birthplace of this new British music. New acts like the Searchers, Billy J. Kramer, Jerry and the Pacemakers and the Hollies were just some of the first British acts to make it into the mainstream. The Cavern Club in Liverpool would be the breeding grounds for these new bands. With a distinctive emphasis on the beat and the snare, it would also undergo a new name beat music, or the Mersey beat. Rocking this new sound to the number one spot, bands like The Kinks, The Rolling Stones, The Animals, The Small Faces, and The Who would go on to become household names. But by the tail end of the 60s, bands were getting fed up of their squeaky clean image and wanted to try and orchestrate their music in a heavier way. The Who by 1966 cracked and started to smash their instruments on stage. 
instrument destruction became an integral part of their concerts. Pete Townsend, known for smashing up his Gibsons, later switching to Fenders because they were cheaper. Even Keith Moon had a go at it. The Beatles, they took this as a challenge to write heavier music. Exhausted from constant touring, the Beatles, by 1966, had completely stopped playing live. Instead, they decided to spend more time in the studio, coming up with new concepts in sound. Helter Skelter was released on the 20th of November 1968. With this sound, they helped create a global shift in the music industry. It was the Beatles' heaviest song, and this sound would pave the way for a future generation. On October the 16th, 1969, Black Sabbath was born. Consisting of guitarist Tony Iommi, bassist Geezer Butler, drummer Bill Ward, and lead singer Ozzy Osbourne. They recorded their first album in London's Regent Sound Studios. It took them just 12 hours to record a whole album. Opening with rain, thunder, and a tolling bell, followed by the tritone, known as the Devil's Interval, sounded the birth of a new form of music, heavy metal. I was born John Michael Osborne, December 3rd, 1948. I was raised in Aston, a working class suburb of Birmingham, England. A lot of the city was destroyed by the Germans in World War II. I used to play on a bum building site thinking it was, it was the name of a place that you go and play, not realising it was a building that had been bombed by in the war. You know? I didn't have a great deal of money. My, my parents did the best they could for us. and. Um, when I was a kid, we'd have like a can of Heinz soup in a saucepan and then another can of water to make it go further. When I was a kid, we used to go scrumping for crab apples. I remember the first time I started the Beverly Hills Hotel, the family climbed by a tree, I was filling my shirt full of oranges. I go, well, we do have them on room service, so I know it kind of, the old habits don't die, you know? Black Sabbath released two albums in the year 1970. The second album, Paranoid, had some major success with the self-titled song, Paranoid went to number four in the charts. This was a major achievement for the band, as they'd never really received much popularity in the mainstream. It wasn't until we got back from Europe that, that the album, we realised the album was in the charts. Listening to the countdown, and the guy said, Black Sabbath, and we went, what? <laughs> and we thought, is there two Black Sabbaths or something? <laughs> Black Sabbath had finally become rock star status. Ozzy Osbourne would be forever known as the Prince of Darkness. Now that the heavy metal riff had been invented, other bands would emerge, solidifying the unique raw sound of the 70s. Deep Purple reached number two in the charts with their song Black Knight and had six songs in the top 40, while Led Zeppelin on the other hand opted to stay out of the singles market and only release albums. Even without any chart success, they managed to become very popular worldwide. Every country they played in, they had a following. Inspired by American rock and roll, they would also go on to be huge in the States, cementing their legendary early career. And Pink Floyd would achieve success in the late 60s with Arnold Lane and C. Emily Play, but they then delved into darker territory. Be careful with the act, Eugene, released in 1969, could quite possibly contain the very first death scream. Was it Pink Floyd who inspired death metal years later? Well, they could be.
Many 60s bands turned to experimentalism in the 70s, including Hawkwind, who at the time was led by Lemmy Ian Kilminster, who they later on fired for his experimentalism. This upset Lemmy at the time, because if it wasn't for him, they wouldn't have reached number three in the charts. And David Bowie had his first hit in 1969 with Space Oddity. It reached number five in the charts. Bowie's audience would grow at a rapid pace as a result. By the end of 1972, Bowie had eight hits in the UK charts, with seven of them being in the top ten skyrocketing Ziggy to stardom. T-Rex was another early 70s band on a winning streak. They reached the number one spot four times in under two years and had 21 UK top 40 hits and simultaneously spearheaded the glam rock movement with lighter riffs, big hair and glittery cheeks. And the softer rock sound helped make rock music more accessible in the mid-70s, softer rock bands like Status Quo were the next big thing. Influenced from old blues and rock and roll, they managed to make pop without being pop. They have only had one UK number one hit, but have had 22 UK top tens. Slade, on the other hand, had six number one hits in the space of three years, and 16 top tens but it would be their Christmas song that skyrocketed them to prominence and is still regarded as one of Britain's most favourite festive anthems reaching the UK charts every December and Elton John would also go on to break the charts from 1971 to 1973 he'd already had 7 top 10 hits in the UK charts his style ranging from subtle piano ballads to full on stadium rock Elton would be adored by a wide range of fans, and is still regarded a national treasure. Now unfortunately, I'm going to have to bring up this man. Gary Glitter. Other than being a disgusting paedophile, he also released loads of charting songs in the 70s. He had 3 UK number 1s and 12 UK top 10s. Why his songs are still in kids movies, I have no idea. Anyway, swiftly moving on. Mud, another 70s glam rock band that really shifted those numbers in the charts. But let's be honest, bands were starting to lose their edge. The unnecessarily garish costumes didn't help. UK rock needed a resurgence. Motorhead. Established in 1975, they brought back the hard, fast sound of the heavy metal. Lemmy Kilminster, who formed Motorhead, wanted to create the hardest sound in rock and roll. He later on achieved that goal, live and on tour. In America, we always was born. And they came off that tour and came back to the show at Portobello Football Ground. They could hear it 12 miles as the crow flies. At that time, Audio Lease put in the biggest audio system that had ever been assembled in the UK. It was like 135,000 watts. When they fired the rig up, they took out the local substation. It blew up. <coughs> we were drawing so much electricity. Out of nowhere, the new wave of British heavy metal was on the horizon. A vast array of heavier bands started to emerge on the scene, alongside the inception of the UK punk movement, with bands like The Sex Pistols, The Clash, and the Buzzcocks, being the main runners, all managing to reach the UK top 10. Punk became an escape for the disenfranchised people of the UK. When you're working all week and struggling to feed a family, it's pretty hard to sing about tiger feet in a disco. The Sex Pistols would cause major offence to the royal family. Their anti-establishment song, God Save the Queen, went straight to number two in the charts, coinciding with the Queen's anniversary celebrations. This caused uproar. The Royal Family and BBC had the song banned off every station, on the grounds of bad taste. The record company sacked the band and destroyed the 25,000 remaining LPs. The Queen officially stopped them from hitting the number one spot. Which? Ladies and gentlemen, brings us on to our next band. She keeps a moist shandle in 
You didn't think I'd forgotten about this band, did you? Queen, established in 1970. Although not charted until 74, their first hit, Killer Queen, would reach number two in the charts. Their albums and back catalogue became immediately popular. They managed to create a sound that was appealing to all ages, but at the same time never lost its rock edge. Freddie Mercury's distinctive operatic vocal style, combined with the rock edge, really made for a memorable performance. Bohemian Rhapsody was released one year later. It was their most experimental song of the time, but it went to number one in the charts, making Queen the most accessible band of the time, with another band coming in close second, ELO. From Birmingham and established in 1970, ELO would go on to have a string of hits in the UK charts. With 13 UK top 10s in the space of 8 years, they'd never be forgotten. Being a band to transition through different genres really helped get them into the clubs. By defying expectations and merging genres, they become one of the biggest bands very quickly. Meanwhile, the more grittier bands were starting to make a name for themselves. Bands like The Jam, The Specials, and Madness. They would slowly but surely start to invade the charts. All being a bunch of misfits, they didn't want to create typical pop music. They wanted their own edge, and at the time, that's what the industry desperately needed. 70s Britain also birthed New Wave and Indie, with bands like The Cure, and not forgetting the creation of electronic music, with bands like The Human League. Listen to the voice of Buddha and Gary Newman. With the introduction of synthesizers and oscillators, 70s music was going through a transformation. Cars by Gary Newman was released on the 21st of August 1979 and it reached number one in the UK charts and become a staple of the British new wave synth pop genre. and Joy Division put Indie on the map. Unfortunately, the band only lasted two years, with lead singer Ian Curtis sadly dying. It was time to say goodbye to the 1970s, and hello to the 1980s. Filled with bold colour and vibrance, brought about with the introduction of Colour Telly, New Order formed from the remaining members of Joy Division in 1980, carrying on Ian Curtis's musical legacy. John Bonham, drummer with the British rock group Led Zeppelin since its inception in 1968, was found dead today at the home of a friend in Windsor, England. Bonham was 32. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Brokaw. This is today, December 9th. I'm here with Jane Pauley, and this entire half hour will be devoted to the murder of John Lennon, ex-Beatle, one of the best known musicians and most influential people of his time. Lennon was shot and killed at about 11 o'clock last night outside his apartment building. News of the Lennon shooting of course spread quickly around the world. With quite an abrupt start to the 1980s, the sad death of three legends, the British spirit only knows one way to move on, and that's keeping the party alive. David Bowie re-reinvented himself and he came out with Ashes to Ashes, which stayed at number one for six weeks. And Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall peaked at number one, and stayed there for six weeks. Bands with more socially aware aspects to their songs started to get into the charts, with more political satire and delving into deeper issues. The 80s also showed its spiritual side. Soft Cell would release their song Tainted Love, peaking at number one in the charts for two weeks. The Communards would also strike number one with their song You Are My World, and they stayed there for six weeks. It was around this point in 1986 when house and dance acts were being brought from America and being transmitted to a live UK TV audience. A new sound was coming from the Chicago... Oh, bloody, you take over, love. 
sound was coming from the Chicago clubs, and Top of the Pops hosted the act that launched House in the UK. Cheers. It's easy to say in retrospect that it was clearly the start of something. But I think it was the start of something. Now this is how it started. My dreams are broken hearted and I won't be... Mate, it was a totally different sound. It was a totally different sound that everybody was talking about and getting really, really excited about. <laughs> By the late 80s, dance music had made itself popular through the underground network and via pirate radio stations, but it didn't take the Brits long to start a rave culture of their own. After 10 years of austerity laid out by Margaret Thatcher, the new generation wanted to live free. They didn't want to play the dusty old radio records, they wanted a fresh sound, a sound of the future. Bands like the Stone Roses, the Happy Mondays and the Inspiral Carpets were all part of the Madchester scene, combining indie, breakbeat and electronic elements. There was another band as well at this point that I must point out. The Smiths. And as previously mentioned, the Inspiral Carpets. Which I'm sorry guys, is the worst band name ever. It sounds like a carpet shop. But it was around this point when DJ started to experiment with old samples. Armand Brother by the Winstons, released in 1969, is famously known as the most sampled drum pattern in the music industry, utilised by many groups, such as the Shut Up and Dance duo from 1988, Messiah the Prince of Darkness from 1991, and Global Method from 1991, and not forgetting its use over in the States. The Almond Break was everywhere, and it wouldn't be long until it was in the UK charts. Brand new acts like The Prodigy, Urban Hype, The Chemical Brothers, and Goldie would be the trailblazers of UK drum and bass. Goings on right now out there, and when an environment gets taken so far, where they're being oppressed by a system, and by bad policing, and by bad community help, and bad housing, which is the main thing which has caused the problem, they made a nest, they made a lair. You know, and they're now paying the price for that. And they blame it on the youth courtship today because of that situation. It's the first British music, really, probably since punk, really. It is just totally British. And it's the first thing that we've had and created for a long time. Goldie just came along and shifted everything. And he's the godfather, really. He's kind of went, it. You're all, you're all idiots. Because I don't believe in any of you now. And I think the thing with drum and bass music at its, at its pure source, it was the punk of this country. It was about working the music to, to, that was completely fresh and new. And you've got this one record going here, and you've got this record going here, and these two records get into the mix, and they just, they just, they just happened at this moment. And for that moment, it's neither one of those two artists, and it just, it's just hyped, it just works. The Prodigy by 92 had three major top ten hits, with Outer Space, Everybody in Their Place, and Charlie. Even to this day, their popularity hasn't faded. They've had 11 UK top 10s and spent 40 weeks in the top 10. Alongside having two number ones with Firestarter and Breathe. Causing the popularity of drum and bass to go global. The government didn't know what it was. The police didn't know how to control it. The kids ran it. It was basically invisible, wasn't it? it was Unless invisible. you were part of it and so many people were part of it. My sort of entry into raid culture was, um, I come back from travelling. And one of her mates come round and um, was just telling me about uh, rave parties and the barn, which was a local club that we used to go to. Um, you know, and just was talking about it with such enthusiasm and such passion that I thought I got a bit of heart on this. It was also around this point when there was a resurgence of British bands, such as the Happy Mondays, Primal Scream, Cast. And the LA is all bringing with them a unique down to earth sound, incorporating more of a working class feel and unapologetically accentuate their regional accents, but more importantly, making UK rock relevant again. Blur, a band formed in 1988 in London, they didn't release anything until 1990 with She's So High. 
but they only reached number 48 in the charts and after three weeks other artists had already taken their spot. It would be a year later when they had chart success. They got into the top 10 with their song There's No Other Way. But they were struggling to keep the ball rolling. Their next five singles just weren't hitting the top 10. It was as if they needed some sort of healthy competition. Straight from the damp rehearsal rooms of Manchester arrived Oasis, fronted by lead singer Liam Gallagher and his brother Noel. Davina, do you want to take over, love? Ha 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 And I love Oasis too, and that's precisely why I made this wish last night so I could see the band and you couldn't. You always have to rub it in. As you may have guessed, we've got Oasis here in the studio. Um, it's Liam on vocals, Noel on guitar, and Paul Booned on keyboards. Booned! Their 1994 debut album, Definitely Maybe, went straight in at number one in the charts. Three of the first five singles they released went straight into the top ten. And on the 6th of May 1995, they got their first UK number one, plus being showcased on numerous TV shows, causing them to become one of the biggest UK bands overnight. Oasis had become an international success, and Blur felt overshadowed by Oasis's success. And they took it upon themselves to get musically competitive and release The Great Escape, which had more of an upbeat pop sound. Girls and Boys, released on the 19th of March 1994, went straight to number 5 in the charts, shortly followed by Park Life, which hit number 10 in the charts boosting them into mainstream popularity and sparking a controversial feud over which band would make it to number one, Blur or Oasis. It was the first time ever that two bands had been pitted against each other by the media. Oasis released Roll With It on the 26th of August 1995 in an attempt to hit the number one spot, but Blur managed to steal it off them at the last minute with their song Country House. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Noel for um, complimenting my wardrobe. <laughs> And I don't own a cardigan, you bastard. Oasis then decided to go all out and write a pop tune of their own. Oasis wrote Wonderwall, which shot up into the charts at number two, shortly followed by their next pop track. And on the 2nd of March 1996, Oasis released Don't Look Back in Anger, which hit the number one spot, causing Oasis to go platinum and ended up winning three Brit Awards, eventually stopping Blur from achieving any awards. I'd like to thank um, all the people. All, all the people. people. So many people. And they walk your county house. And it has through their shite life. After this, we knew that Oasis could hold their own, and they didn't really have anything to worry about anymore. What do you think of Blur these days? What? Not a lot. Not a lot? No. Yeah, I'm not in competition anymore with a Blur and that. Blur is Blur. You know what I mean? It took them five years to get number one, right? It took us fucking 12 months, yeah? If you've got the time to sit down and worry about American culture creeping into British society, then I would get a proper fucking job, you know? He's such a condescending cock, isn't he, you know? Oh fuck, I wrote this album so I could stop American culture coming to Britain. Fucking wanker. What's up? John, would it be okay to stand over there? Stand <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. there and ask your question. Okay. It's gonna be fine. Okay, I'll just. Okay. We're all gonna be fine. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it, mate. Uh, ah, okay. <laughs> Okay, as long as we got that on tape, that's all that counts. Well, what we're looking for here is lots of eye contact. Okay. 
Who are you? My name's Damon Oba. Who are you? I am Nardward, a human serviette. Damon, who do you have why, with you? Why, why do you call yourself a, a human serviette? I call myself the human serviette because I help serve the youth, but I want to help serve you guys right now, Damon. And who else do you have in the group with you right here? Who is the gentleman that just took my hat? That's a nice smile. All right, Daisy Bollocks, how you doing? Good. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Happy to be here. Are you happy to take uh, my yeah. hat? Are you uh, happy? Yeah. Are you happy? Are you happy? Well, what about your other uh, yeah. bandmate? Do you like you taking happy? all the attention? Uh, yeah. I am very happy. I'm not you that happy until happy. I get my hat back. You look happy. Now, Dave, you haven't talked about your other bandmate there. You're taking all the attention here. You're neglecting your other bandmate. Who's behind you right there? Damon, who's to your right? Do you like Daisy Bollocks? <laughs> you happy? No, I'm not. You don't look happy. I am not. I want my hat back, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. If you could please, Dave, acknowledge who's behind you right now. <laughs> well, I will do right now. Who are you? You know who I am. You are Alex. That's right. So, Alex of Blur, who invented fish and chips? Who invented poo? Yeah.